Welcome all and thank you for joining today's webinar. My name is Ben Cordingly and I'm one of the enologists here at the AWRI. In the spirit of reconciliation, the AWRI acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. In this se session, we'll look at biosecurity technology. While we give people a chance to log on, we have a couple of quick reminders to anyone who is new to AWRI webinars. If you'd like to provide a comment or ask a question, please click on the Q&A button on the Zoom toolbar, type in your question and click send to shoot it through. We'll be holding a Q&A session at the end of this presentation, but feel free to send in your questions at any stage. A reminder also that this session is being recorded and you will be emailed a link to view the recording on the AWRI's YouTube channel. For anyone who's just joined, welcome. Today's webinar topic is biosecurity technology. It is a great pleasure to welcome Craig Elliott from One Australia, Dr. Rohan Kimber from SADI, the South Australian Research and Development Institute, Tony Kanine from the WA Government Department of Primary Industries and Regional Development, and Guy Davidson, Davidson from Onside Intelligence to the webinar today. Shakira Johnson from OSFEG will also be joining us for the Q&A portion at the end of the webinar. First up, I'd like to introduce Craig Elliott. Craig has been the project manager for biosecurity RDNA in Wine Australia since the start of this year. Prior to that, he led a project jointly funded by Wine Australia and Hort Innovation, preparing the wine and horticultural sectors for Xylella fastidiosa, Australia's number one plant biosecurity threat and well known to wine growers as the causal agent for Pierce's disease. Craig has a long history in biosecurity, working in senior levels in the Queensland and Tasmanian governments, leading biosecurity and NRM programs and emergency responses as a consultant, advising, training and evaluating government and industry bodies on biosecurity and emergency preparedness, responses and recovery efforts. Craig, if you're ready to make a start, I'll hand over to you. Great, thanks, Ben, and uh, thanks to the entire AWRI team for, for hosting today's uh, webinar. Uh, but biosecurity is often equated with, with bad news. Sometimes it's, it's only when we actually have a pest or disease outbreak that it gets the, the attention it needs. But if we wait until the point of that outbreak to work out how we're going to respond, we'll be chasing our tails. And we need to use the, the relatively quiet times that we have in between outbreaks um, or uh, quiet times during our, our business operations to make sure we're prepared for when uh, things start to go wrong or whether we do actually have to respond to a pest or disease. Now biosecurity is all about risk management and given the multitude of biosecurity threats out there and how hard it is to actually detect and manage some of them, there's no chance of us ever having zero biosecurity risk. So the work that you hear about today is some of the research projects and other activities that One Australia is funding or supporting through the R&D levy and it's part of the core part of the uh, preparedness work that we're doing um, to work with the, the sector. The idea behind it is, and particularly in terms of these uh, projects that you'll hear about, is to have the ability to rapidly, efficiently, effectively uh, identify, detect uh, particular pathogens and insects out there that present a risk to our sector. And also how um, we have some systems in place. Um, you'll hear from a guy, Davidson from Onside, as Ben said, talking about their um, software and their app that they use and how they can actually support growers, both in terms of managing biosecurity and other risks on their property, but also support uh, an emergency response if we are actually responding to a, uh, an emergency. So really pleased to see this uh, come forward and I look forward to uh, hearing a, an update from each of the speakers. And I'll pass back to you, Ben. Thanks for that introduction, Craig. Um, I would now like to introduce Dr. Rohan Kimba. Rohan is a senior research scientist at SADI and has been with SADI since 1996. He has transitioned his research studies from pulse pathology to new technology and systems development for the IMAP Pests Sentinel Surveillance Project. This project aims to rapidly and accurately monitor airborne pests and diseases in many crops across Australia. Field deployments of its Sentinel platforms provide fast-tracked regional pest information directly to growers and consultants. Rowan, if you're ready to make a start, I'll hand over to you. Thanks very much, Ben. I'm assuming you can hear me okay and see the presentation that's up. Uh, thanks for this 
opportunity um, uh, to present on this uh, on the IMAP PEST project. Um, certainly, like to uh, like to acknowledge a number of uh, contributors, uh, both for this national project uh, at SARDI, but also our um, technology partners, and and also Shakira Johnson at Ausveg for um, leading the project. Um, I just want to give you a, a bit of an overview as to what exactly IMAP PEST is and how it brings some new capacity to both biosecurity, but also endemic pest and disease management relevant to uh, viticulture, but also multiple ag sectors who are all invested in the project. We're bringing new automated uh, platforms into the field. These are uh, in a varied shapes and sizes, but they're all uh, uh, being, being named sentinels in the, uh, the project. Um, these sentinels are placed in the field. Um, they uh, have uh, either single or multiple uh, air samplers on board that have uh, connected to autom automation and uh, they're collecting uh, air samples. They're collecting uh, airborne spores, uh, flying insects. Uh, they're doing this into a um, into single pot or single vial samples, which are all barcoded. These uh, samples, which are collected regularly from a sentinel that's deployed in the field at a given location, um, pass through a few different diagnostic pathways. Um, one of them is the um, uh, QPCR uh, high throughput facility. I uh, can just pointing out here with a cursor at uh, SARDI at Molecular Diagnostic Center using QPCR assays. Um, there is a visual assessment of pest, uh, pest, path, um, pest targets um, through the entomology laboratory. Both of these two diagnostic pathways are connected to a database to, to um, push on the results. Uh, but also we have uh, partners in AgVic uh, with metabarcoding, uh, also looking at the capabilities and the relevance of metabarcoding to sort of look at deeper into samples of uh, pests. Um, the data goes through to a, a, um, a cloud, as does all of the data from the Sentinels themselves. And that's weather data and operational data. When all of these data sets are married, then it's a, really just a matter of visualizing these targets to the uh, end user. Um, and in the case of the endemic targets, um, that's to growers, consultants, uh, end users to visualize the data that we see and we've, and we've captured and uh, monitoring using this Sentinel system, but also um, it's just a matter of a simple directional flow for biosecurity targets. And um, these obviously go to, these are sensitive targets that might go to uh, chief plant health officers or um, go through to uh, um, government, which are alerting uh, a target that has been identified using this system that is, uh, falls into that category. Um, just to show you the shapes and sizes, the, we started off with uh, trailer-based prototypes of the Sentinels. We moved to more flexible um, systems, which uh, embraced a more robust automation. Uh, that was part way through the project. and. And uh, but we also uh, some of these have uh, on board six meter traps uh, and they are specifically designed to be capturing migratory insects uh, such as aphids. So um, but uh, all of these are still uh, serving the same sort of purpose, and that is a, an automated platform to collect and monitor for pests and diseases. Um, look, after the last three years has been pretty frantic, we now have done over 40 deployments using these sentinels across Australia. You see this little gift firing away. It seems very South Australian centric here, but that's just because during the pandemic we were bound by borders. But uh, since they've been opening, we've, we've got across to other um, key locations uh, in ag sectors that are invested in this project. So uh, they're dominated by the Eastern seaboard by nature of the, the industries that we've been working with. But at the same time, it is a national project. We do have collaborations with the West as well. Um, these deployments have been uh, across uh, major agricultural sectors. Um, a lot these platforms themselves are very flexible, so they've been shipped by truck or trailer or, um, or alike, and uh, we've had a, a really helpful collaboration with others to help deploy and, and collect samples and send them through. So I just want to talk about the gig that we've been doing with Treasury Wine Estate and the Coonawarra using Sentinel-4 
It's equipped with a, an air sampler for spores, known commonly known as a cyclone sampler, as well as a, a two meter insect trap as well. Uh, we haven't emphasized the insect component of this so much in this trial, but certainly pathogens have been a focus. And a simple way it really works is that it's a high volume sampler, 200 liters a minute, compared to traditional methods, which tend to be around about 10 liters a minute. And they operate on a daily schedule sampling um, schedule and, and uh, collected each week. So that's six vials. It takes a couple of days of freight to move those vials back to Sardi's Molecular Diagnostic Centre. And uh, the Sentinel collects live weather data. And this trial is ongoing, but it's, uh, it's been on since uh, March. And uh, Treasury Wine Estate have been, Treasury Wine Estate have been great collaborators to look into this. So um, just to show you how it works, if the, the data goes to our website, I'm at pest.com.au, you'll come to a dashboard, a trial data dashboard, where you can simply click on that and it gives you our current data and a series of tiles of locations, but you can look at previous deployments uh, and a, a longer list of uh, ones that we've been undertaking um, through the project over uh, the last few years. But uh, as an example with current uh, deployments, if uh, we're looking at say the Coonawarra here, when you click on that, you'll, it will bring up the live weather data from the Sentinel with temperature, humidity, rainfall that's presented on, on a timeline graph. Uh, there might be a couple of interruptions from technical faults, but generally it's continuous. And then um, it's a simple case of uh, choosing your pathogen of interest at Treasury Wine, a state of obviously been looking at a uh, number of the uh, Udipa dieback, uh, Udipa um, um, pathogens, and that's a complex, and those pathogens are presented on timeline graphs um, across the same, so you can compare it against the weather, as well as um, just take note that those scales do change um, because uh, the pathogen quantification changes according to the individual target of interest. So um, just selecting the Udipa targets, we, we have a number of assays to look at Udipa. Um, but um, really the ones that are really of key interest is uh, Cryptovalsa, Ampelina and uh, Udipalata. They seem to be the ones that are, are, are really um, most abundant at, at that site. And we compare this against rainfall and they're also the, they were the most relevant winter diseases for uh, vines in that location. What we really found was um, uh, what, we've, what was quite interesting was that uh, uh, initially, initially, it was quite low peaks of Crypto Balsa Ampelina, and it seems to be the most abundant pathogen of this complex that, that we're able to investigate. But really started seeing very high peaks come August, and that dwarfed these earlier peaks. They are normally associated with rainfall, and Dr. Mark Sosnowski has done years of research on this and, and has been engaged in this project, and we consult him over it. And, and he uh, certainly this uh, this pathogen is he has identified as a one of the more emerging ones in the complex that in this particular location. So it's been an interesting output. Um, Udipalata, um, which is a, another specific pathogen, um, only very few detections have been located at that trial site, and uh, this scale is a much much lower scale. So these spore numbers of that pathogen are, are much lower, but still there are distinct peaks of that part of the, of the Utipa complex. Um, again, associated with rain. And if we look at it just now, the data set as a whole, if you went to the website and had a look at the uh, outputs for this trial site for Coonawarra, you'll see over this long timeline from March to present, you can really see a, a very strong signal uh, of uh, Cryptovalsa ampelina uh, since August, uh, quite high spore numbers that have been detected through that period. Um, and uh, but there are just still a few hits of uh, Udipalata, which is um, much lower level, but they were very, very clear and distinct peaks that have been occurring in that September, uh, August and September period as well. So it's been an incredible uh, data set uh, to try and inform uh, growers as to, or the, the Treasury Wine Estate people as to what might be happening when it comes to through pruning activities and what they might need to be doing to protect moon, what, um, vines. Uh, and Botrosfera dieback is another pathogen that we monitor for. But this is a very, very low level detection that we notice of that particular complex or that particular pathogen rather at that location. 
Um, so going forward, we will be continuing this trial. We're changing the panel to do now spring diseases to include uh, bet um, botrytis and uh, powdery mildew. And we'll uh, continue through to, um, uh, through to December to, uh, to have a look at um, how those foliar diseases uh, as um, the, um, they're obviously post bud burst now and as the foliage really starts to, uh, to flourish, then uh, what's happening with the peaks of those diseases and how it might impact uh, actionable information for managing of those diseases. We are co-located with a, a, um, a group called Bioscout uh, in, they're also been working with Treasury Wine Estate, so it gives a great opportunity to co-locate a couple of different technologies and we'll be keen to investigate and have a look at that as well and, and, and what sort of outputs the, the two systems, which can work quite complementary, might, uh, might achieve. Uh, just backtracking a little bit on, on, on those foliar diseases, we did investigate this at uh, Tappan Upper Wines in uh, Adelaide Hills where we did it in a little bit of a uh, collaboration with uh, Syngenta with Dr. Belinda Rawnsley. She was um, uh, assessing trials about 10 kilometers away from where we had Sentinel-7, which is pictured there in those, uh, in those uh, tier one vineyards with Tapanapa at Piccadilly. And uh, what we found is that there were some very distinct peaks of powdery mildew and gray mold that occurred in the, um, uh, the spring and summer periods, late spring and summer periods. And uh, these uh, seem to really drive an epidemic that was able to be um, monitored and assessed by Belinda in uh, vineyards that were actually 10 kilometers away. And those red arrows indicate the um, points of assessment and, uh, and an increasing incidence of disease. And you can see those driving peaks of powdery mildew there that occurred sort of before and in between those assessment periods. And, and that's really what was driving the development of that disease. So there can be quite actionable information that comes out of this and uh, as well as uh, potentially informing models and forecast systems. Now, just on botrytis, we did look at a, uh, a number of cyclone samplers or sentinels are across the mid north looking at the uh, sort of the spatial component. What we found is that uh, uh, over a 40 kilometer distance, this was in, even though it was in grains, it's still a relevant pathogen in botrytis cinerea. We found over that 40 kilometer transect that we saw some quite distinct, distinct peaks that occurred around about July uh, 16, 17 at all of those sites. And, uh, and just looking at a cursory glance of the weather data that comes from these sentinels, we, we noticed that it seemed to occur at a drop of relative humidity, an elevation of temperature and, and a, an occurrence of a rain event. So these, these triggers can be quite complex, but at the same time, the, the data rich nature of the of this sort of surveillance and capacity can really inform and, and be uh, subject to greater analytics to understand what these triggers really are. It's not just about pathogens, it's also about insects. Um, here we have an, an example of a biosecurity, uh, potential biosecurity incident where Sentinel-4 in that Coonawarra vineyard um, picked up a suspect serpentine leaf miner, but uh, it, that was what, thanks to uh, Rebecca Harmdorf as it passed through that um, visual assessment, she was able to uh, alert of the potential. And then a bit of Sanger sequencing was able to confirm that it wasn't actually a sensitive pest target. It was not serpentine leaf miner, but it was just a uh, close, uh, close related um, cousin, so to speak, but uh, not a not notifiable pest. It's another example uh, of this same system uh, is when the metabar coding system, when Sentinel-4 was located up in, in uh, vineyards up at um, Mildura and near uh, citrus orchards as well. And they, um, Ag Victoria, were looking at the metabar coding for screening for African and Asian citrus psyllids. And they got a, uh, a close but uh, not notifiable hit when they thought they found a psyllid that was of interest. And while it wasn't the... Um, uh, one of the uh, notifiable psyllids of concern, it was able to demonstrate this meta barcoding platform could be used as a screening tool to uh, identify biosecurity targets, uh, as well as also inform incredible information on biodiversity that occurs in these monitoring trials. And just a quick uh, an example of how pathogen biosecurity might be relevant here, uh, the sentinels on their regular deployments to grains and uh, horticulture and viticulture, we actually have detected myrtle rust for the first time in South Australia using this system. And um, 
uh, this has been uh, obviously uh, pushed through to uh, Biosecurity SA and they've been uh, uh, hunting for the disease on, on where we have seen it occur on a few South Australian sites. Uh, it's normally in summer and it's a very, very low influx, but uh, it's uh, able to give a spatial uh, point in time to uh, of a detection using a uh, high throughput and fairly rapid system to help inform those strategies to mitigate these uh, potential biosecurity threats. Um, just going forward, these devices of Sentinels becoming more and more compact. They uh, are, uh, we're looking at satellite connectivity. Uh, we're looking at uh, how they might work in comparison to other samplers as well. And, uh, and, uh, and how these may, may be used to increase the number of uh, monitoring points across a landscape. But also um, what's particularly uh, exciting is uh, other downstream diagnostics from this where we might or layers, we might link it with remote sensing layers, but also samples can be pushed onto meta barcoding of, of these spore samples. We're doing that as a pilot study with ANU uh, through the University of Canberra and, uh, and exactly, you know, look, maybe identify uh, haplotypes or different uh, strains of a pathogen, but also um, potential fungicide resistant alleles. And that's also being investigated through SARDI with a collaboration with Curtin where We'll be soon testing some uh, fungicide resistant alleles as part of the regular QPCR outputs and the high throughput systems. But uh, down the bottom, you just see there's an incredible data rich set. Each one of these samples are a un unique identifier. They're associated with a sentinel, a date, a time, a location, a uh, long list of weather data, and then a long list of pathogens that are able to be investigated on those individual samples. So I'd just like to thank AWRI, I'd like to thank collaborations with Treasury Wine Estate for the uh, particular study that's relevant to this presentation, as well as uh, to uh, um, and the research groups and partners, and a good link with um, Dr. Mark Sosnowski, who's just done a lot of work in, as you'd all be familiar with, um, and uh, as well as support of Wine Australia and, and our international partners. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ron, for your presentation. Those sentinels seem like a great way to identify pest species in the time frame that actually allows for early intervention and forward planning. Now I'd like to introduce Dr. Tony Kaneen. Tony is a laboratory scientist at the WA Department of Primary Industries and Regional Development in South Perth. His research interests include rapid characterization of pathogens and vectors using Oxford nanopore technology sequencing devices, comparing the e efficacy using rapid enzymatic and temperature driven DNA and RNA extraction techniques to column based DNA extraction methods, both in the laboratory and in field settings. Tony completed his PhD in computational biology at the University of Western Australia, where his research focused on the African cassava whitefly, syst systematics and patterns of molecular evolution. Tony, if you're ready to make a start, I'll hand over to you. Uh, thank you, Ben, for that wonderful introduction. And uh, I would like to thank AWRI for giving me this opportunity to present the work that we are doing in WA. Uh, this work is part of the Nanopod Diagnostic Project that is led by Dr. Monica Kiho in WA. And it's under the uh, Boosting Diagnostic Capacity Project, which is a national project and is funded by GRDC and Rural Research and Development for Profit. As for today's talk, um, I'll start by giving you an outline of what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to introduce you to uh, the Oxford Nanopore Sequencing Technology, uh, its applications, and how we are using it to identify viruses, specifically grapevine viruses and insect, insect bugs that really transmit the virus. I'll go ahead and talk about some of the assays that we've developed under this project. Then I'll zero down to the targeted umbilicon assay, which, which is an assay that uh, does the PCR and the sequencing at the same time in one single tube. And we've used it for simultaneous detection of about 12 viruses, as I'll explain ahead. Then I'll also uh, talk about the interactive pipeline that we are using to analyze uh, this data from the uh, targeted umbilicon assay. Uh, 
These are some of the portable sequencing devices that we've been using. They are from Oxford Nanopore. And the first uh, picture on the left is the Mark one mb the MK1B, which is a portable sequencing device. It was the first version. It has a flow cell. So you would load your library onto that device. And uh, at that time, you needed, you had to connect it to a laptop such that you do live based calling. But because of advancements in technology, Oxford Nanopod developed uh, another device, which is on your right side, which is the MK1C. We are using that device to sequence genomes. And uh, that device has now got, got a, a GPU compute node on it. So you do the live based calling on it. You don't need a laptop to do live based calling like live based calling. So uh, those are some of the portable devices that we're using and they've got a vast range of applications. Uh, I highlight a few here. Uh, the device gained popularity in the early 2015 uh, when it was first used to sequence the Ebola virus genome in real time. Thereafter, it was used to sequence uh, Zika virus. And uh, after that, we used it to track the evolution of plant viruses uh, in Southern Africa and the rest of the world. And currently it's been used to sequence uh, uh, COVID-19 virus genomes in real time. So we've used it in WA and in this project to identify insect vectors such as aphids, so we've been sequencing whole genomes, then we pull out the mitochondria cytochrome oxidase one gene to identify the insect bugs. And we've also used it to sequence uh, plant viruses, especially uh, grapevine viruses. We've done whole genome sequencing using this device and also amplicon sequencing using this device. So I'll give an example of what we've done with this device in the field. Uh, since the device is portable, uh, it's very easy for us to carry out uh, sequencing in the field in real time. So for you to do sequencing in the field, you'll need to extract DNA because the device takes in a DNA library. You'll need a rapid sequencing kit that you'll have to have. Then you also need a machine that will help you extract DNA in the field. So this is the blue device that you see there. It's called the PDQX, which simply means pretty damn quick extraction device. It's produced by a company called Microgem, and it can help you extract DNA uh, in less than 30 minutes. That it uses a cocktail of thermophilic enzyme and everything happens in one single tube. So you use it to extract your DNA. And after you've extracted your DNA, uh, you prepare a library using the rapid sequencing kit, then you load the library onto the nanopore sequencing device. Uh, we power these devices, both the Minon uh, device and the DNA device using a battery in the field. And we were able to sequence uh, our samples in the field. So in this case, we looked at, at first uh, aphid samples. We got six aphid samples, these are the results that we sequenced uh, in the field using the rapid library sequencing kit. And uh, uh, after three hours of sequencing, we were able to get these results. Uh, we pulled out uh, the MTCO1 gene because we did whole genome sequencing. So we pulled out the MTCO1 gene for species identification. Then we were in position to identify this uh, aphid species on the farm. That was the deeper actual field. So as a proof of concept, uh, um, before I go there, I wanna let you know that uh, the, we learned something as we are doing this on the field. The next time I'll go to do uh, NS sequencing on the field, I think I'll have to go with a portable shed, uh, such that I protect the device from direct sunlight. And also we had ice, ice blocks, but I think it would be good if you have maybe a portable fridge if you're to do sequencing on the field and maybe you may need a spare battery. So in the picture there, you see some of the devices that you need if you're to do this in the field. I, I talked of the DNA sequencing, I mean the DNA extraction device, which is the blue device that you see there. Then the uh, nanopore sequencing device, which is portable and you can, see, you can load your library for sequencing on it in the field. Uh, there is a kit that you have to use there, uh, which is a, a little bit faster to, 
So it's the rapid sequencing kit. You only need 30 minutes to prepare, to prepare the library for sequencing. Then we also had a battery, then a laptop to analyze the data set after sequencing. Um, as a proof of concept, uh, we've showed that this really works. Yes, you can do sequencing in the field. Uh, the questions that I would like to ask you is that, uh, should sequencing be done in the field? That's a question uh, a particular researcher or anybody who is interested in doing that is supposed to ask themselves because there are advantages of doing things in the field, but there are also limitations because how many samples are you going to do in the field? Um, can you do 100 samples in the field or can you do six samples in the field? So those are some of the questions that I'll leave to you to answer. Should we sequence near the field or should we take these devices back to the lab and we enjoy the rapid turnaround time that they give us? In the lab, uh, we've used these devices as well and we see that uh, the turnaround time to the result improves so tremendously because they are rapid sequencing devices. And uh, also I want to emphasize that if anybody is interested in sequencing something, something in the field, you also have to think about how you're gonna package these devices and how you take them to the field. So on the, if you see the picture on the left, you see how much we packed recently when we get, went for the pest blitz. You had to pack a lot of things to go to the field and do that. But sometimes if you need to find a few samples in the field, then it's necessary for you to go and test there and then and find out, but still you have to bring the samples back in the lab for further analysis. But as a proof of concept, it works and we've done it. We can sequence uh, things in the field. Uh, under the diagnostic project uh, that I talked about, we've developed several assays and that's one of the assays that I've just explained, which is the rapid vector identification assay. We can use this to identify uh, vectors like merlin bugs, white flies, and, and aphids in the field. But there are also other assays that we've developed, most especially the laboratory assays for uh, identifying grapevine viruses using Oxford nanopore technology. We also have the field assay for that. But today, uh, for this talk, I'm going to talk more about the targeted amplicon sequencing assay. This assay uh, is for simultaneous detection of about 12 grapevine virus targets. And all that happens in a single tube. And I'll explain more about this in the few slides to come. Uh, before I explain the targeted amplicon sequencing assay, I would like to introduce you to the pipeline that we are using to analyze that data set that we generate using the targeted amplicon sequencing assay. COVID-19 uh, came up with some good things. I know it's been so hard for everybody, but a lot of tools in the scientific world have been generated, and this is one of them. So this tool was created uh, during COVID time to analyze uh, COVID genomes. And uh, uh, this tool has got some good things because you can customize it to do uh, amplicon sequencing, and that's what we've done. Uh, we've customized it to do things that we want. Um, and we think that if everybody analyzes the other time this way, uh, this would be an easier way of ensuring reproducibility and consistency in a diagnostic setting. So this tool has got potential for high throughput analysis and uh, automation. So to give you an understanding of how it operates, um, a team uh, led by James Ferguson designed this tool. So they designed about 14 primers spanning the entire COVID genome. So these primers, um, what you do, you have to uh, carry out one PCR reaction in a single tube, then you sequence the product of that reaction. And as you see in the picture, you find that most of these, uh, like you see the sequence that for each tile, spanning the whole genome. So in this case, they were able to recover uh, coverage over this whole uh, genome of, of COVID. So in the same spirit, instead of us amplifying, I mean, uh, targets in one single genome, we decided to amplify targets of specific viruses. And that's what I'm going to show you in the targeted amplicon sequencing assay. Uh, 
The advantage this uh, pipeline has is that it's so sensitive compared to the traditional ways of uh, sequencing genomes. Uh, it's a method that can deal with things like low viral titer, which are usually challenging uh, when you use other traditional sequencing, genome sequencing methods. You know, when you're sampling uh, samples, most of the times tissues, the viruses are not evenly distributed within particular tissues. So you, you are likely to get some samples that have got low viral titer and others that have got a high viral titer. So in situations where you get a sample that has got a very low viral titer, then the targeted amplicon assay or this kind of assay is uh, really important because it can deal with that. So back to the amplicon sequencing assay, like I said, uh, in this assay, we're targeting 12 grapevine viruses and we only have to do one PCR that has got a cocktail of these 12 viruses. As you can see, we have all the refros, refro one, refro associated virus one up to refro four and the associated strains, then GVA and all the viruses as you see there. Then we prepare our library for sequencing using the rapid sequencing kit. And then we analyze the data set using the interactive pipeline that was developed by James Ferguson. Um, when you look at the results, uh, you can see that you have these tiles that we've designed the 12, prim the 12 primers targeting the 12 viruses. So if this is, these are results for a single sample and this sample had got a uh, multiple infection of about five viruses. It's a, a, so when we analyze this data using the pipeline, you can see that in this sample, we detected a leaf row two, leaf row three in positions two and three. Uh, then G, uh, grapevine pinotibris virus in position eight, then uh, the next one in position 10 and grapevine repetris stampeding virus in position 12. Now in position one, you see we don't have any coverage, any sequencing depth. So that means that that virus, there was no virus in position one. So this, that means that uh, refro one was not detected. The same applies to refro four because there's no coverage, it wasn't detected. So it's an easy way of analyzing this data set. And at the end of the day, the program also gives you sequence information, which you can use to study other things like variants and mutations, and also keep for phylogenetic analysis. Like any other good thing, there are advantages for this. Like I've already told you that uh, since when you're sampling, sometimes viruses are not even distributed. So this is a technique that can handle samples that have got low viral titer. Uh, you can, uh, also another advantage is that you can amplify several viruses simultaneously. Uh, and also, we've also used it to sequence a whole genomes actually, with the analysis that maybe I'll present in the near future that we've developed that can, we can, be, that can be used to sequence um, whole genomes of an exotic. Um, the turnaround time is uh, very good compared to when an individual PCR is done. Imagine in this case, you're only doing one PCR and you're sequencing that PCR and it has 12 virus targets. But imagine if you are to do a, an individual PCR for each virus, you will need to have uh, 12 PCR reactions and that will be those will be a lot of resources used, but in this case, you save on resources, you save on time. And then in the future, I think this will become very, very cost effective. If you only have to sequence one PCR product to identify 12 virus targets that are important in, 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 in Australia. So we can simultaneously detect uh, several targets and also discover mutations using this method. So like any other good thing, it has got limitations. And one of the limitations is that you must know the virus you're working with such that you design primers in those specific regions to identify these viral targets. Then also you require, you, you have to know some, you have to have some skills in high throughput sequencing and bioinformatics. And the turnaround time for HTCs is a possibility, but it's still limited. Uh, there's a lot of pipetting, so, but we hope this is coming soon 
we know that very soon we should we are going to automate this process if you're to work with thousands of samples you need to automate this kind of thing uh, I like to say that the methods we've developed here are not replacing any other traditional method, but they are replacing, they are not, they are not replacing any other traditional methods that we have, but they are just complementing what we have. So we can say they are just a tool in the diagnostician's toolbox. With that, I would like to acknowledge uh, GRDC and Rural Research and Development for Profit for funding this project. I'd like to also thank my boss, Dr. Monica Kiho, for leading this, this project and also the team members at the Department of Primary Industries and Regional Development uh, that help us most of the time. I'd like to thank you for listening and I'll get back to Ben. Thanks, Tony. Most of us would still think that DNA sequencing is something that is done in specialised labs. So it's pretty amazing what you're able to do out in the field on a fold up camping table. So thanks very much for your presentation. I'd now like to introduce Guy Davidson. Guy was the fifth employee at Onside. He has helped grow the company from its grassroots as a visitor management and health and safety platform for New Zealand dairy farmers into the digital toolkit it is today. It streamlines safety, productivity, and biosecurity across rural sectors in Australia, New Zealand, and the United Kingdom. Guy has predominantly spent his time working with Onside's viticultural and horticultural customers, and has recently moved in the biosecurity arm of the business. Onside Intelligence helps to implement and manage solutions for optimizing preparedness and response to biosecurity incursions across entire industries. Guy, if you're ready to make a start, I will hand over to you. Good to go. Thanks, Ben. And, and thanks, Craig, for inviting us along for the chat. Um, it's a great introduction there. And it's almost like I wrote it myself. I was going to introduce myself. I forgot I'd already done that to you. So um, I'm Guy. Uh, some of you already know me. Um, I saw a few familiar names on the list of people. But um, for those that don't, yeah, I work for a company called Onside. Um, and yeah, our mission is to manage the world's biosecurity. And we're really starting with that in um, Australasia. Um, so we're out of New Zealand, have been in Australia for the last 18 months or so, um, and continuing to rapidly grow here. So what, what I wanted to talk about today on the theme of biosecurity technology is our on-site intelligence solution, um, which is essentially a biosecurity traceability readiness and response technology. To begin with, though, um, a, a lot of this um, data we collect to be able to use it for biosecurity purposes is driven from our digital toolkit. So that, that was our core offering and, and still is, and it continues to grow from, uh, as Ben said, health and safety visitor management into what we call a digital toolkit because it covers so much um, different areas for um, farmers, growers, and contractors to use daily to improve their efficiency. So things like visitor management, um, productivity, like task management, job tracking, um, compliance, where it could be um, you know one of the biggest adopters or drivers for adoption in Australia, viticulture has been to help with the Sustainable Wine Grow in Australia certification because it can collect visitor records, it can do your OHS, um, it can map out certain things like chem sheds and so on. Um, safety, big part of it, um, being able to make sure people leave when they are supposed to so that they go home safe at the end of the day, being able to map out risks, um, report incidents, et cetera. And then on-farm biosecurity as well, um, having questions and rules and um, automated alerts if people are doing something or, or say that they might have done a, a movement that's a risk of bringing a pest or disease onto a property. Just to give you a sense of um, where we're currently at with the digital toolkit, we've got over um, 1.3 million chickens collected through our app. We've got over 14,500 properties mapped um, and over 50,000 risks logged. This is what it looks like visually. So um, you can see New Zealand's lit up like a Christmas tree. We're doing really well there. Uh, we work across all rural sectors. Wine is one of our biggest. Um, kiwi fruits, the, the biggest. Um, but then we go across dairy, livestock, um, you know, starting to talk to seafood and, and all these different industries. So, um, yeah, we're, we're growing really rapidly in Australia, as you can see. Um, I began my journey in Adelaide um, in June of 2021, and that's when we officially launched here. And since then, we've continued to grow um, pretty rapidly. Wine is, is one of the major sectors we're focused on, but working with almonds, citrus, 
um, but a livestock dairy, et cetera, as well. And then a small, small footprint in the UK. So that's the digital toolkit. And then that all ties into what we call on-site intelligence. So on-site intelligence is essentially a, a network-based solution to help with traceability, readiness, and response. How that works is um, with our on-site app, you can map out your property and you can pin out things like risks, tasks to do, um, et cetera. And then what happens is the farmer, the orchard manager, vineyard, et cetera, will map the site. And then um, staff, contractors, suppliers, visitors will be checking in and out of that property, which is a digital boundary of the site. As they check in, they create this check-in event. And if that person checks into multiple properties, they start to build this traceability um, route. And that mass becomes a network builds a network we can also input third-party data into that so the common one we talk about is movement data you can do um, truck telemetry so we've done projects with livestock trucks because that's generally how um, animals would move and we compared it to the equivalent of the nlas data in new zealand and that data um, and then you can do things like tracking ship movements um, you know vehicles machinery equipment um, but third-party data can also be uh, pest and disease inputs so um, what the previous speakers have spoken about, they could all be inputs as well. So every time you get a positive or a negative result that you put into the model, it will change um, where it directs your testing or your monitoring or your surveillance. So this is how it breaks down. A check-in from one property to another creates a connection. So someone checked into this property, then checked into this property, um, maybe it's a, a pruning crew going from one property to another, for example. Those connections create networks. So this is um, sometime earlier in the year, we just pulled a, a view of our network in New Zealand. This is what it looks like. So you can see it's, it's pretty crazy, the interconnectivity of um, an entire country. And, and that's hugely important in Australia because there's often quite a state-based focus um, when it comes to biosecurity, say health and safety legislation, whatever it may be. Um, but pests and diseases don't care about um, geography. They don't care about sectors often. Um, so it's really important to be able to have this um, unbiased technological view of how pest or disease might move based on how people, machinery, equipment, and plant material uh, move around a country or between countries even. The kind of things that you can pull out of that network is um, being able to improve your surveillance. So um, being able to say, based on the way the network moves in our known areas or our risk areas of a pest or disease, these are the top 10 properties that you should put constant monitoring and surveillance on to make sure that you're um, on top of, as soon as you can be, any sort of incursion or spread of an endemic uh, pest or disease. Um, and it makes sure that if you're testing those 10 properties, they're the ones with the highest impact through the network. So as long as you're on top of those and not letting things pass through there, you're basically keeping the largest part of the network safe from pests and diseases. Um, similar methodology with the response. So if you find a, a new incursion, you find a new disease that's on a property um, or a pest, then you can say, okay, we already know how the model works or how the network moves. So if we put a positive result on that property into the on-site intelligence solution, it will then map out the 10 properties that you should go and test first to be able to um, be the most resource efficient with dealing with a disease and, and trying to get in front of it as fast as you can. This image on the right here, this was actually a project we did um, with a, a company called Osprey in New Zealand. And this was around tuberculosis and livestock. And um, this was the one actually where we did track livestock trucks around to see how a network moved um, of animals being dropped off and picked up. And what this image is showing, there's, there's a few interesting things that it showed. First of all, it showed that um, this property here on the West Coast, they thought that Canterbury was TB free, so there wasn't a lot of testing um, going on in Canterbury, but there is a, a high wildlife population of TB on the West Coast, um, which edges farmland. So there was a good chance that that would get into um, some of the animals and the livestock on the farmland edging those wildlife populations. And if a, there was a connection from this property on the West Coast into Canterbury, so that was unknown until we picked it up passively through the data of the truck movements. And once it got into Canterbury, it spread like wildfire. I'm sure most of you have heard about Embovis and how that spread around. So basically what it told us is um, if you monitor this property constantly and make sure that no diseases come through, TB in this case, comes through this property, you can be pretty confident it's going to be kept out of the Canterbury network. So what, what these circles are showing are the 10 most high impact properties to test first because they would spread it the furthest through the network. And if you tested all those properties and they all came back negative, 
the yellow is actually the reduction in testing that you'd have to do because you can be almost certain that the disease hasn't got to all of that yellow area because it hasn't come through one of these 10 properties. So then you'd rerun the model again based on all those negative results. It would tell you the 10 most impactful properties to go in and test. So it's really about risk-based testing and, and not just get a gun testing um, in an area that you know has had a disease. It's about how does the network move? How would it spread on the certain vectors that spread it? And then where should we go put our resources first? You can also use it for traceability. One knows this through COVID, but being able to um, detect the source of where something happened and then trace back forward and where else it could have gone. Um, and then again, with, with Australia in mind, the industry-wide biosecurity operations is hugely important because you know um, it, it's all across viticulture, across states, but then also there's, there's plenty of pests and diseases that don't just attack viticulture. They, they can come from other sectors or go to other sectors. So being able to do pan-sector and um, you know national um, operations and, and diagnostics is, is really important. So I want to spend a bit of time um, talking about a project we've got going on at the moment in New South Wales. So um, in conjunction with funding from the New South Wales um, Innovation Hub or Drought Resilience Hub, um, we've been working alongside New South Wales Wine and New South Wales Department of Primary Industries. I just want to actually shout out how beautiful this is to see from an industry point of view or from a supplier point of view. Like this is a really, really great um, example of collaboration between government and industry because it needs to happen. This is what needs to happen to really properly protect industries and, and make this whole biosecurity thing work. So this has been fantastic to see and, and to work with them. They've been super collaborative and, you know, the growers, the feedback from growers has just been phenomenal. They're, they're really excited. Uh, about the fact that um, government and industry are taking this really seriously and, and trying to put measures in place to help um, prevent, you know, an outbreak if anything were to come in to New South Wales. So really the scope of this came from, um, from Mark Bourne at, at New South Wales. We got talking um, last year, I believe it was. And really what Mark wanted to do is, is a couple of key things. He wanted to improve traceability of people, machinery and plant material um, because he thought that, you know, the way it was paper-based and things like that right now, um, didn't give you the visibility and the immediacy to the visibility you'd need in a response situation. Um, assisting agencies and producers meeting their biosecurity responsibilities, increasing biosecurity awareness and compliance in the wine sector, uh, providing risk-based data-driven approach for optimizing readiness and response, and minimizing adverse effects and economic impacts of an incursion. I think that last one's really important because um, you know you never think it's going to happen until it happens, and when it does happen happens fast and there's a huge cost associated. It's not uncommon for it to be, you know, a billion dollars to respond to an incursion. Um, and that's not just straight financial impacts. There's also a whole bunch of, um, you know, emotional damage and stuff that comes with that because it is people's livelihoods that gets ruined by these things. I'll go through the different levels of what we've set up um, for this New South Wales project. And, you know, the, this is uh, pretty similar to what we're doing with the kiwi fruit industry. Um, in the wine industry in New Zealand, but it starts with the on-farm biosecurity. So we work closely um, with the team at New South Wales DPI and New South Wales Wine to come up with a template that we want people to um, experience or have to go through when they sign into a property. So a contractor, visitor, even staff members, when they sign into a vineyard, for example, they'll get uh, this check and flow that they go through with a couple of questions and rules, et cetera. So the question, for example, we have these customizable questions that can be customized per sector, customized per geographical area, even customized property to property. And uh, basically you can ask some direct questions. Have you visited vineyards outside a region in, in the past 28 days? Have you cleaned machinery or equipment you're bringing on? And you, you, you set an um, undesirable answer. So if they say, no, I haven't cleaned equipment I'm bringing on here, we'll ping an alert to the vineyard manager or grower to say, hey, so-and-so has just tried to check in. They said that they haven't um, followed this biosecurity rule, essentially. You might want to have a chat with them. Um, and the person checking in will also get a similar notification to say you need to contact the vineyard manager or um, owner to have this conversation to make sure you're allowed to come on. Not saying that they are bringing something on, but saying these are the people you should take the time to stop and have a chat with to make sure they're not um, coming from a you know phylloxera infested zone, for example, straight to your vineyard without cleaning your equipment. We've set up a template for these um, what we call check-in rules, which is heavily focused around biosecurity. Um, we've attached a few documents that help people educate people on what is phylloxera, how to identify it, how not to spread it, and some general hygiene um, tips. And then also we've linked to some online information about cleaning, 
um, your best best um, guide to cleaning equipment, and also a vineyard biosecurity induction video that um, Leonie from DPI has put together. Um, and then also just a general rule about reporting anything strange. This is what we've templated for all the growers. So we've set this up for them as they've been joining this pilot project. Um, they can add to this about operational stuff for their own vineyards. They A lot of them will put their speed limits and things like that as well. So they can add value to it for themselves. But what we're doing here is we're, we're not expecting everyone to be biosecurity experts. We're giving them all the information and people that visit their properties, all the information they need to try and reduce or eliminate the spread of, of pests and diseases before it even happens, because that's the best thing to do is to stop the spread before it happens rather than having to respond to it. In addition to that, what we've done, um, which is adding information to um, DPI in, in New South Wales wine to be able to use for simulations, for preparedness and, and for responses, is actually um, getting some more details recorded on particular high-risk movements, vectors that would um, you know, indicate a higher risk of spreading something like phylloxera. Um, so how we do that is that there's a job page that people go through when they check in. Um, operationally, it's about um, knowing who's on site and what they're doing, um, being safe about if someone's around you spraying versus someone's around you doing pruning. It's a different story of safety and being able to have records of that. So for the grower, it's operational. Um, for a DPI or a New South Wales one, what they're able to use it for is saying, okay, well, these are the jobs that we think indicate um, a potential movement of equipment, machinery, or plant material onto the property. So if any of these specific jobs that we collaborated on um, are selected, then it will pop up a prompt basically to say, are you bringing anything on today? If they click no, happy days, it just goes along the normal flow. If they click yes, take them to a form that we've um, pre-formatted, again, with a collaboration of growers um, and industry and government, being able to say, okay, these are the um, key bits of machinery, equipment, and plant material that we really care about um, to be able to drill down to in a response or for preparedness purposes. Um, and then some other questions around, have you been out of state or in a certain flocks or area? So all of this is, is um, customizable. Again, it could be different for if you're in, in aquaculture or if you're in a different sector or looking at specific pests and diseases. So it's all super flexible and, and we sort of work through um, on a case-by-case -case basis with each customer what makes sense to go in here. What that all boils up to is some actionable insights for an industry or a government to be able to use um, for preparedness and response um, and traceability. So that information, and, and it's an important thing to talk about, I'm sure the question will come up, is around the data. So the data is the growers, it's always the growers and that's how we always think. Um, we go through a, a stage of um, basically them agreeing to share information, um, anonymized information with industry bodies or governments for the purposes of biosecurity. So the, it's it's all super clear above board, we, we communicate it well um, and they have the power to opt and opt out of this um, data sharing. Um, so that's what anything that is um, shared gets boiled into this um, dashboard that we put together. And what, what an industry or a government can start to do with that is look at things like um, trends over time, start to look at uh, what's being recorded more frequently than not. Um, and then, you know, get down into the traceability of movements, but also, you know, being able to, as I was talking about before with the livestock example, being able to actually identify what are the most influential or important properties in this um, network of whether it's, um, you know, national wine, New South Wales wine, et cetera, being able to look at what are the 10 most prominent properties that would have the biggest impact of spreading a pest or disease around based on the certain vectors that it spreads on um, so that you can put in the right measurements in place to make sure that you're well prepared for um, in, anything coming in and ideally stopping the spread. But if it does spread, being able to respond rapidly because you're not having to collect all these paper records of movements and things like that, it's all ready to go at your fingertips. So as soon as you get a positive result somewhere, plug it into the model straight away, you can start to direct resources in the most efficient way. One of the most important things for this all to work is grower buy-in. Um, so, you know, you, you, you look at these classic biosecurity apps that have one purpose, one value, it's just for biosecurity. There's not a, a whole lot of return value for the grower. Um, Look at the COVID app, for example. People use that a lot when it was on their doorstep, when people were scared of it, you know, when there was actually seemed to be some value for them. But as soon as people weren't so worried about it or, you know, they'd stomped it out in, you know, South Australia or whatever, then they stopped using it so much. Um, that's because it had a single line of value. For, for us, like, 
our, our starting point was having this app and building this app and co-developing this app with rural industries, viticulture being one of the main ones, to make sure it's something that's extremely useful and used by them. Because if you're only collecting data in war times, um, kind of like what Craig alluded to before, at the start, it's in the peace time that you can really get these measures right and start to collect all this data. So that in the war time, you've, al you've already got a rich data set that you can use for this response and, and an effective response. It's no good starting to collect movements the day a disease comes in because it'll, you'll, you'll be so far behind it and you won't be able to get in front of it. So things like being able to map um, tasks out around the vineyard and using it operationally, being able to map out hazards and using it for their health and safety compliance, as well as um, you know being able to use it as a tool for um, managing and improving a lot of the areas of the Sustainable Wine Growing Australia certification. Um, those have all been lots of drivers that encourage um, more frequent use and, and uh, bigger adoption from both people that visit the properties and the people that manage the properties. So that's a really, really important part because you can tap into truck telemetry and, and shipping and all that sort of stuff easy, that's passive. The hard part is getting movement data from people, machinery, um, equipment and, and plant material. And for that, you need, you need really good buy-in from people on the ground. Growers, like I was saying, are super important. So we've been going around doing these workshops. Um, you know, we've been going to these different regions and, and setting up times to sit down with growers really take them through what this project's about, train them up on how to use the on-site app, set their properties up with them, basically getting them ready to go so when they leave um, at the end of the workshop, they can just start getting people signing in and out um, as soon as they get back. So that's been really important and, and I've done a few trips out there already um, going back and forward. I didn't realise I could fly to Orange from Melbourne, so I flew to Sydney and drove up. I won't make that mistake again. Uh, but it's been, it's been really good to get to know these people and, and build that trust. Like, in the um, sort of four years odd that I've been working for Onside, that's been a huge part of engaging, whether it's growers, farmers, whoever, it's a very trust-based um, trust based environment. So being able to show face, prove that you're, you're a person behind the machine and, you know, actually build a relationship has been, been really important with that trust building. So these are some of the current customers we've got on the go. Um, Q Fruit Buying Health in New Zealand, they were really um, one of the, the first ones because we had such a rich network already in Kiwi Fruit. Um, New Zealand Wine is, is a more recent one, so we're going to be sitting um, up with them in Marlborough to begin with. Uh, Marlborough District Council, that's an interesting project. We're actually doing a simulation uh, of Chilean needlegrass across the whole Marlborough District. So that's a really interesting um, e example or exercise in looking at a, a pest or disease view rather than a sector view, because I think that's too limited. Um, like we'll talk about before, pests and diseases don't often limit themselves to one sector, they'll, they'll go pan sector. So being able to look at the holistic view of that, I think will be extremely interesting and useful. Um, and then as we're talking about New South Wales, one in New South Wales DPI with the Drought Hub um, doing the projects, pilot project now. The future potential I see for all of this, and, and this is hopefully where some of you can um, walk away and think about this, is that we have no geographical boundaries. We have no um, sector boundaries and you know, our tech it, it is really well adopted on the ground already. We're not, we're not building something from scratch. And that was sort of the purpose of showing the scale of adoption to start. People like and use this system. So it's not something that we have to fight too hard to get people to adopt. Um, and then it gives you this really, really nice view of, of national or even international, you know, we can look at things coming in from other ports and stuff like that. So getting this really big holistic view, like I was saying before, our, our uh, mission is to um, manage the world's biosecurity. So we're, we're off to a really good start in Australia and New Zealand, and hopefully we'll be able to scale that up across the globe. This is an interesting picture. This is actually um, looking at the phylloxera zones, the phylloxera management zones. It may be a bit out of date now. I think I did this last year, but um, this was just looking at some of the check-in data moving around over top of the phylloxera management zones. And this gives you a good visual representation of these movements are happening. Like you're probably aware that they are happening, but it's hard to actually visualize or identify them until you see it um, through passive data. And that's where we can start to feed some insights and educate, even educate people. Some people don't know what the rules are and, and what they can and can't do. So that's a big part of it as well. So th thanks for the chance to present today. Um, look, we're always, we're always looking forward to more um, projects that we can help work on. So if anyone thinks that this would be useful um, for your sector, for your state, um, or if you know of anyone that you think could get use out of this technology, let me know. My details are up there. 
Um, and if you've got any questions, feel free to either ask today or reach out separately. Thank you. Thanks very much, Guy. Your app looks like a really good way of integrating such a wide range of data in a simple and useful way. Uh, I'd now like to invite all the presenters to join us for the Q&A session. We also have Shakira Johnson from Ausveg joining to help answer some of your questions. Uh, so if you can start sending through some of those questions in the Zoom Q&A toolbar, we'll try and get to as many of them as possible. And I can see that people have already been sending in some questions. Um, so just bear with me for two seconds. All right, the first one might be a, a Rowan and Shakira one. Uh, do your IMAP Sentinel units provide data around non-flying insects, i.e. crawling and walking insects? Um, I, can, I can answer that, but uh, Sh Shaq is here because I've got to dart off soon. So please, if I'm rude and suddenly shut down, she'll field the rest. But um, uh, no, look, it's, uh, it is airborne pests and diseases that is the primary focus of uh, the Sentinel Systems and the IMAP Pest Initiative. And those uh, the targets that fall into that category had all been selected at the beginning of the project by um, each of the sectors that are uh, or the, uh, through the RDCs and through the, an extension uh, mechanism coordinated by Ausveg to engage uh, those industries to say what targets are on their hit list that, uh, that get triaged into that category. Thanks, Ron. I've got one for Tony. Um, for the tolled amplicon sequencing method of grapevine viruses that you have developed, what's the current throughput? So how many samples can you typically sequence within a day? Uh, Tony, you're on. Yep. Oh, yeah. So far, we've tried it on 12 samples, but there is potential uh, to increase the number of samples that you can really do. Uh, and this depends on the, on the backwards that are supplied by Oxford Nanopore. There is, uh, first of all, the rapid kit can only supply 12 backwards. But you can use the ligation sequencing kit where you have uh, an opportunity to use the native backcoding kit that can work up to 96 samples. But uh, like I said, that in process will involve a lot of pipetting. So we need to automate that process of pipetting all those 96 samples. But uh, lots of people have done it. They've done the 96 samples. Maybe they are using robots in uh, public health. And I think that's where we are going. So you can, we have done it on 12 samples at a time, but you can, they, you can do it on 96 samples. Thank you. Thanks, Tony. Uh, we've got another one here for Rowan and Shakira. Uh, can downy mildew spores be tracked using the Sentinel surveillance systems? No, not yet. Um, it's, uh, it is a simple case of an assay being developed um, uh, as are any of the pathogens that we track for at the moment, there's a you know suite of about 15 or so pathogens that we report on in an individual air sample. Um, that can be added to uh, to increase that number. Um, but the assay hasn't been developed for downy mildew. Um, and it's been flagged before as uh, an obvious candidate and, and something that we'll certainly explore. Uh, jumping to powdery mildew now, uh, someone's asked, they're interested in the powdery mildew that was detected in Piccadilly. Was it a spore load detection or a conditions flag? Um, was this in the canopy on vines or related dappled shade on unit? Or was it spores in transit? Yeah, so that is spores in transit. The sampler on the Sentinel, in fact, you can see it in the picture behind me. That was the actual... Uh, uh, Sentinel-7 that was located at the Piccadilly Vineyard. Uh, the, the air sampler that uh, catches um, fungal spores catches it at two metres. Uh, that is just above the canopy um, and it is designed uh, for that, that, that height is actually consistent on all of our Sentinel deployments and all of our Sentinels and, and ideally suited to uh, transit spores that move in an air column that is uh, well known in literature to be uh, sort of representative of, of uh, longer distances. Uh, traditionally, if you're just looking at an epidemiological point of view, you might trap uh, low down or right inside of a canopy. Um, so whereas we're actually interested in more sort of inoculum that moves that 
threatens a vineyard or a crop that uh, is coming from either a longer distance uh, and uh, uh, sort of representing an influx into that area. But it is alongside the canopy, so um, it, it uh, probably is also going to reflect movement uh, within that canopy uh, because it was only separated by a few metres to the first row. Thank you, Rohan. Um, all right, we've got some for Guy. Um, should the federal government purchase onside for every sector across the state, uh, across the country? It looks like a good general biosecurity data solution. Someone's also uh, asking if there's anything going on in Western Australia as far as onside is concerned. Yeah, look, I think Paul's hit the nail on the head there. What do you reckon, Craig? <laughs> Yeah, we'll let Paul uh, actually put the uh, the proposal together there. <laughs> yeah, and and the answer, Paul, is absolutely would would give you a good price. But uh, in all in all honesty, like that's where we think it's going to go. The the hard thing is like because we've talked to a lot of industry bodies about this, and and everyone thinks it's a great idea. Budget always it always comes down to budget. Like there's there's only certain levy fees that often industry bodies have, and often the bucketed quite specifically so then like finding the budget for something like this that would be really useful for industry can often be quite hard so I, I, I we totally believe that government will have to partner with them that's what i was saying like I, lo I love this collaboration i'm seeing um with the new south wales guys because um even in new zealand like this is where it needs to go the, the government is the one often that ends up paying the most in a response anyway so it makes sense um for, for them to be able to partner and and help fund a sustainable solution um, for all rural industries. That's, we, we just recently got um, a grant from uh, the Ministry of Primary Industries in New Zealand called the Sustainable Food and Fibres Future Grant. And um, they they basically are co-funding co a $10 million grant for us to be able to power up this technology and with the view of rolling it out across all rural sectors in New Zealand. So, yeah, I mean, look, if we could do something similar in Australia, we're, we're totally open to it and, and very keen to... Um, get something like that moving I think you know not not just with um, viticulture but you've got FMD LSD um, all these things that are sort of scaring at the border and and you know even these livestock diseases they won't just impact livestock they'll impact movements across tons of different sectors um, so being able to help with more risk-based data-driven approaches to identification and management and um, ideally you know even proving the negative so people can continue moving and operating and selling um, rather than doing blanket bans when there is a disease outbreak, those sorts of things we'd love to be able to help with. So I think there is a big incentive for um, government involvement. Thanks, everyone. It doesn't look like we've had any more questions come in, but if you do think of any more questions, um, please email them through to the AWRA help desk. That's helpdesk at awri.com.au and we'll forward them on to the individual presenters. Um, so yeah, thanks very much, Craig, Rowan, Tony, and Guy for your presentations. And thanks to Shakira for joining in for the q and I'd like to thank you, the audience, for joining in and taking part. And I'd like to remind you that as always, you'll receive a link to view the recording of this presentation on the AWRI's YouTube channel. I'd like to acknowledge Wine Australia for providing funding and support for webinars via the AWRI Extension Project. The next AWRI webinar is on rootstock choice affecting methoxypyrazine concentrations in Shiraz and Cabernet Sauvignon Rackus with Ross Sanders from the University of Adelaide. This will be on Thursday, the 27th of October. If you'd like to register for this session, please visit the AWRI website. Thanks again, and I look forward to seeing you at the next AWRI webinar. Thanks, Ben. Thank you.